I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Caleb Bupp. Dr. Bupp is a pediatrics trained board certified medical geneticist with Beaumont Health, Spectrum Health, and Helen DeVos Children's Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In, in visiting with him before this presentation and a little bit even tonight, uh, I've learned a lot about um, his focus and it really is on children, although more and more adults are seeing him now, but so much of his work uh, has been focused on bettering the lives of, of newborns and of children. He serves as the Division Chief of Medical Genetics and Genomics. He is also an assistant professor at Michigan State University. He is the chair of the State of Michigan's Newborn Screen Quality Assurance Advisory Committee and a member of the Michigan Make-A-Wish Medical Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Caleb Bupp. It is a pleasure to uh, get to talk about genetics and genomics. Uh, if nothing else, when we finish, you're probably going to think that that guy is really excited about it. And so I hope that at the end, you're a little bit excited too. Um, my goal when I talk is always to sort of educate. Um, I'd like you all to be a little bit better of geneticists before the end of the night. And I also want to just give you a flavor of like what's going on right now a little bit, where did we come from, and then kind of tip our hand towards where are things heading, um, because it is a very, very exciting time. There are some things that we need to be cognizant of and that we need to be careful about, but overall, this will hopefully be a message of positivity and excitement. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and jump in. A couple of caveats for you. The first is I like to tell patient stories as we go through here, so I'm going to attempt to kind of ground things in patient stories as much as possible. The reason for that is that we're all patients for healthcare at one point or another. And it doesn't do us a lot of good to just talk about ivory tower research studies and stuff like that. How does it actually impact us and our kids and our grandkids and our community? So that's one of my goals here. And the second thing is I'm gonna talk about all sorts of things, but I am one person sharing tons of stories that come from a massive team of folks that work on this. So um, kudos to all the other folks that are a part of the work that we're doing at Helen DeVos, and you're gonna see far beyond that. So well, I think one of the questions that we raise sometimes around like precision medicine or genomic medicine, what is it? Is it a person like that's uh, Francis Collins who did the Human Genome Project, former director of the NIH? Is it a building? Is it a label that we put on a hallway and call it our precision medicine center? Is it a, a, a technology or a machine? Like what is it? And it really is everything. It's all of this coming together. And what I'm gonna hopefully give you a sense of is how that's happening here in Michigan, truly in our backyard, and how that's changing the face of medicine. This is a visual that I like to use a lot because this is what medicine is when it comes to genetics. It's looking for a needle in a haystack. Something is wrong. Maybe there's a solution or an answer somewhere in there, but how are you gonna find it? And the whole idea of a needle in the haystack is it's kind of hard to find. And what I want to suggest to you is now we're at the place where we're looking for a needle in a haystack with a metal detector. We're getting that fast, more binary yes or no answer in a way that we can start to impact the medical care that we're giving to folks. And as we go through this, I'd like you to consider wearing different hats. There's some very famous hat wearers. What does this all feel like as a patient? What does this all feel like as the parent of a child or the parent or the family member of somebody? What does this feel like for the clinical team, for the nurses, for the hospital administrators? What does this feel like for the insurance company, right? This is impacting all the different aspects of healthcare right now. And that's one of the cool things because it is an opportunity for pretty much everybody to get a win, if you will. And we don't get that a lot in healthcare. So we're gonna do some basics first. So. Stretch your brain a little bit. I'm gonna take you back to biology class or maybe a little bit further. One of the reasons that things have changed so fast is right here on this graph. Unfortunately, a lot of things come down to money. Sequencing and genetic testing has gotten so much cheaper in the last 20 years. When the Human Genome Project was done around the turn of the century, one genome, three billion dollars, it came in under budget at 2.7 billion dollars and it took 10 years. You can now do a genome. Actually, one of the big companies announced today they're lowering the price to $200. And the world record was just set earlier this year at doing a genome in nine and a half hours. So that's a really big, like, steep decrease. And hopefully, again, from like an economic standpoint, it makes sense why that is driving things fast. Technology is a huge part of that. 
com computation has just gotten better so we can do more faster. The world has also gotten smaller. Gene Matcher is kind of like a, a Craigslist for genes or like Facebook Marketplace. It's a place where you can kind of match with people all across the world to find folks who have the same genetic change or the same sort of research interest and work together. So our team had the opportunity of helping describe a new gene with a group from Saudi Arabia that we met on Gene Matcher and the folks that did our computational work were in Belgium. So the world's just gotten smaller. I've never been to those two places, but we can connect and have things go further faster. And the last thing up on the top there, uh, sort of a screenshot of 23andMe, is we're just a little bit more comfortable with genetics as a culture right now, and I think that's playing a role as well in things advancing. But when the heart of it all comes down, this is what it's all about. It's about the kids, it's about the families, it's about the individuals that we find things, give answers, give them hope, and ultimately I like to make sure that we're always grounded in that. So. The history of genetics is a long one, but it's honestly a fairly short one. So we didn't know how many chromosomes there were until the 1950s. And it's fairly astounding that we couldn't count to 46 correctly about 70 years ago, and now we're sequencing billions of nucleotides. So we've come a long way in a short amount of time. But from a genetics perspective, this is the basics. So every cell in our body has chromosomes in it. That's sort of the instruction manual, if you will. The chromosomes are made up of DNA. That's kind of the blueprint, and then the DNA makes proteins. So when it comes to genetics, this is kind of where it all lives. And so from a genetic testing standpoint, this was kind of the first genetic test, if you will. This is a set of chromosomes underneath the microscope. They look like squiggly worms, and then you can put them in order artificially. This doesn't happen naturally. Um, and you can pair them together. They match. We have two of each because we get one from mom and one from dad. So this is very, very basics. And then two X chromosomes or in an X and a Y chromosome. So the first genetic test was really counting the 46, and sometimes when you did that and there was something extra, you said, aha, what is going on? This is an extra chromosome 21, so this would be an individual who has Down syndrome. You probably could recognize that someone has Down syndrome, and in fact, that was a recognized syndrome before we even knew the genetic cause, but this is a way to do a test, to see something different in the genetics, and then kind of connect it with the patient that you see in front of you. So very, very basic is something they're not counting. The next step in genetic testing evolution was a, was a methodology called FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Not overly important that you remember that, but this is only counting to three, okay? Because in this case, you're using a fluorescent probe that's tagged to a specific area of the genetic code and you're counting. And we typically should have two of everything. And if you count to three or if you count to one, something is either extra or missing. What was different was this, is you can do it fast. This takes about two days to do, but you have to know what you're looking for. So nowadays, even still, if a baby is born with Down syndrome and you kind of need a fast answer, you can take a spot of blood, do this fish testing, and within a couple days confirm that it is indeed what we think it is. So kind of the next step in evolution, using other techniques to look at that. And then computers have made that easier to do. Now there are computer chips where you put your sample on, and it does lots of those tests all at the same time and kind of gives you a readout looking through all the genetic information. And that particular test has a name called a microarray. And we have our 46 chromosomes. The chromosome analysis of the karyotype counts those chromosomes. The microarray slices and dices those 46 chromosomes into a couple of million tiny pieces and looks to see if those are missing or extra very quickly. So again, we're taking things and we're kind of upping the game over and over again. But everything I've talked about so far is quantitative. Is it there or not? And we talked about in the beginning our genetic code, our DNA. Well, things could be missing or extra, but we also know that there can be spelling errors or mutations in our genetic code. So this is an analogy I, I like to use. Think about your genetic code like a set of encyclopedias. Do you remember when those existed and those like took up a shelf in your house, right? So a set of encyclopedias on the shelf is like your genetic code. A chromosome analysis is looking at that set of encyclopedias and saying, are any volumes missing or extra? So it would be fairly easy to do quickly counting, seeing if something's missing or extra. The test that I talked about, fish or microarray, would be like looking through all of the encyclopedias for missing pages or missing chapters. So something that you could do, if you knew where to look, you could go there quickly. Sequencing is like doing a spell check of all the genetic information, and it's similar and that if you know what you're looking for, you can go right there. But sometimes with health, we don't exactly know what's going on, so we have to look other places. So 
An example of that would be achondroplasia. So achondroplasia is the most common cause of someone being a little person. Most folks who have achondroplasia have a change in the exact same gene, and most folks have the exact same change in the gene. So if you want to do a genetic test for that, you only have to look at one gene, you only have to look at one particular area of the gene. So it's a fairly quick and easy thing to do. Well, we know that things like autism or epilepsy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be caused by a lot of genetic things. So if we want to do genetic testing for that, we would do what we call a gene panel. We have about 20,000 genes roughly, and some panels will look at two genes, 10 genes, 100 genes, 1,000 genes, kind of just depending on what you're looking for. But what I want to move towards is talking about these two tests, exome sequencing and genome sequencing, because what those basically are is spell checking the entire genetic code. It sort of feels like the American way, right? Big, bad, broad, fast, okay? Exome and genome sequencing, and that's what we're gonna talk about as we go through here together. I wanna take a little bit of a curve and talk though about some what if things. So if we have this ability to do genetic testing, if we have the ability to look in our genetic code to see what we might find, what if we find things we don't wanna find? or things that we wouldn't expect to find. So this is your colon. It's not necessarily your colon. And <laughs> you may have seen these pictures afterwards when you're a little groggy. This is what your inside of your colon should look like, okay? Nice and smooth. This is a colon that is full of polyps. And folks who have a colon that looks like this can have a genetic condition where they have a change in their genes that they were born with that causes them to get tons of colon polyps and they eventually will get colon cancer. So this is this is sort of the colon's equivalent to BRCA1 and 2, the breast cancer genes, okay? So if somebody has a change in one of these genes, they have a 100% chance of getting colon cancer at some point in their life. Now, a lot of folks have this. It's rare, but 100% risk. You also say they have a risk of getting all sorts of other cancers, not 100%. But if you find somebody has a change in the, one of the genes that cause this, they have to get screened their entire life. They have to get checked over and over again. So think about doing genetic testing on a child. What if you found a change in this gene? What have you done to the rest of their life? You probably will keep them healthier by doing this, but in some ways you've rendered them medically complex. Getting insurance will be complicated. So these are kind of the things we have to be careful about with genetic testing. When we look at everything, we might find some things we wouldn't expect. Another thing that I want to kind of talk about, genetic testing can be done prenatally. So taking a sample and understanding the genetics of a baby that's growing. So for those who have been through pregnancy or family members go through, there are all sorts of tests that uh, moms have during the pregnancy, blood tests and things like that. And some of those will tell you things about the baby. There's this new technology that's come out probably in the last 10 years, and it's called cell-free fetal DNA analysis or non-invasive prenatal screening. And I'm gonna give you kind of an example of what that looks like in a second. Traditionally, if you wanna do genetic testing during a pregnancy, you have to go get sample. Amniotic fluid, CVS sample, comes with a risk of pregnancy loss. When you get that sample, you have to take it to the lab. You have to culture it. It takes a while. It takes days, weeks to get results back. So sort of a slow process. It has some complications to it sometimes. Cell-free fetal DNA testing is done with a blood draw from mom, and that's it, okay? So the idea behind this is actually fairly brilliant. So it turns out that in all of our blood, there are tiny pieces of our DNA in our blood. So if we took a blood draw from anybody, we would find little bits of DNA in your blood. Well, when a woman is pregnant, there are tiny bits of the baby's DNA in mom's blood. So if you take a blood draw from mom, you can start to sort of infer some things about baby, okay? So think about it this way. If we set up buckets for every chromosome and we take a blood sample and every piece of DNA that comes out, we put in the bucket where that came from. So this little piece of DNA was from chromosome two. So we put it in that bucket. This is from, from chromosome nine. We put it in that bucket and we do that. Then we go back and we look at all the buckets and we see that the chromosome 21 bucket has more bits of DNA in it than the rest. Well, what we can infer from that is that the baby might have Down syndrome caused by an extra chromosome 21. So using a safe test from mom, you can learn things about baby. Another example of that would be looking at all the buckets and there's bits of DNA from chromosome X 
but there are no bits of DNA from chromosome Y, so are you having a boy or a girl? So this is the way that genetic testing done prenatally can tell you things that we previously couldn't learn. You can probably imagine there are all sorts of ethical questions around this. How far should it go? What should we do or not do? But it's technology that we now have, and we have to figure out how to handle it. So I'm going to blow your mind a little bit more by talking about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So the idea behind this is taking egg and sperm, putting them together, growing up an embryo to go through like in vitro fertilization, which some folks do, but taking a small sample from that embryo and doing genetic testing on that to figure out what embryos may or may not have a particular genetic condition. So this is the kind of situation, take cystic fibrosis, a fairly severe disorder, lung problems. Most folks um, will pass away younger. That's a recessive disease that kind of gets passed down. So if somebody knows that they have a chance of having a child with this, they can go through this process and sort of move away from the possibility that they might have a child with a particular genetic condition. And again, I'm just throwing all these out as kind of some like what ifs because these are the more challenging things that we now have to think through, figure out how to handle, how do we feel about it, how should healthcare feel about it um, because of the technological power that we have. A couple other things I want to mention real quickly. Pharmacogenomics. So the idea behind this is that our body processes medications differently. And probably inherently that makes sense to you, right? If you have a headache and I have a headache, we probably don't take the same dose. We might not even take the same medicine that makes us feel better. And we probably don't feel better as fast. We're each unique genetically, and that impacts how our body processes medication. So it might make sense that if we understood our genetics better, we would be able to not have to go through the drug A, drug B to get to drug C. We could start immediately to drug C. Or using the map analogy up there in the corner, we could get to the wellness flag sooner than later. The idea behind this is very, very solid, but the practical application of it is really, really challenging. So this is what a, a test report looks like for pharmacogenomics. And I don't mean to uh, explain this all to you, but it's complicated. And it also is looking at changes in the genetic code that are common variations, okay? So there's this term that it would probably be worth remembering called polymorphisms. And they're exactly what they sound like. They're common changes in our genes that we all have. It's what makes us unique. And we have millions of them, okay? Not all of them are important. Polymorphisms, though, are what we can use to kind of make predictions or guesses. Polymorphisms are how paternity testing works. Because if there's enough in common between baby and mom or dad, you can match them up, okay? Polymorphisms are also how we make predictions about what medicines might work or might not. So again, this is just a, a sample report from a lab, and it gives you a sense with antidepressants, which drugs might work or might not work based on sort of the common differences in your genetic code versus my genetic code. One of the problems is the medications that are most helped by pharmacogenomics are the kinds of medicines that we kind of try and we go up on the dose and we go down and we switch to another medication. Pain medications, antidepressants, medications for ADHD, medications for seizures. These are all medicines that there's not necessarily always the first one is the right one. There's a little bit of a trial and error process. So I throw this out there as an example to you of somewhere that healthcare is going because as we understand our genetics better, we're going to be able to target our medicines better for the individual. The last thing I want to talk about in the what if thing is the direct to consumer testing. So 23andMe would be an example of that. This is spit in the tube, send it in a box and uh, you'll get results back. And you or your family members may have uh, done it. I'm not passing judgment to your face. Um, <laughs> but I took sort of a screenshot from the website and I gave you the prices too so you'll know, right? And I want to give you a sense of what kind of is out there with genetic testing that you can get without being involved with a doctor or anything like that. You can get health predisposition, carrier status, wellness things. Most of this, at least in my opinion right now, is kind of entertainment, okay? The thing that I would want you to remember with this kind of direct-to-consumer testing is beware of false reassurance. 
the testing behind it is very, very sound, but it doesn't look at everything. There's a reason that it costs $99. And it's not because it's a bad test or anything like, like that. It's just doing kind of the bare minimum. You might not be able to see from where you're sitting, but almost all of these have a little asterisk after them. So I pulled up all the fine print for you, and I'm not going to read it to you. But really what the fine print is laying out there is kind of what I was trying to say. Don't be falsely reassured by doing this testing. So this, one of the health predispositions is for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Breast cancer, very reasonable thing that someone might be aware of. But even there it says selected variants. And what the problem is, is that the test that's done for breast cancer here is only looking at about two or three or just a small number of specific genetic changes that are actually very, very uncommon in the general population. So some folks might do this testing and think that I tested negative for breast cancer when indeed you did not whatsoever. It doesn't mean that what it did was bad, it's just not the full picture. So again, a little bit of a public service announcement for you about this sort of testing, just to kind of know what you're getting into. It's very interesting, lots of people are having this done. The amount of data that has been generated by this is unbelievable. And I think it's really helping move science forward, but it comes with a bit of a trade-off. All right, so we're gonna to start to shift to some of the fun stuff now. Because when it comes to genetics, it's kind of all about finding the one. What is going on and what do we make of it? So again, we have billions of nucleotides and when there's a health issue going on, the question is, what's the root cause of it? And how do we find that particular one? So, why does this all make sense? I don't want you to think that like I'm an evil businessman when I'm going through this stuff, but it's just the practical nature of how healthcare is right now. Rare disease is honestly not that rare. When you put everybody together that has something unusually, uh, unusual in their genetics, it actually ends up affecting four to eight percent of the population. And that's more than folks who have cancer and AIDS combined. It takes a long time to make a diagnosis when somebody has a rare disease. I would imagine most folks in this room have been or had a loved one go to a doctor or some sort of medical care and not be able to figure out what's going on right away. We call that the diagnostic odyssey. And the diagnostic odyssey sometimes can be very, very long. It can take years to figure out what's going on. And sometimes, well not sometimes, if it takes a long time to figure out what's going on, it ends up being expensive. It's expensive for the patient, for their employer, for the insurance company, for the healthcare system. And this particularly is enriched in kiddos. Most kids who are born aren't sick. So when a kid is born and they're sick, we should think genetic maybe more than we should. So our, our neonatal intensive care units, our hospital units where kids are, are there, are much, much higher rates of genetic disease there and outside. It's a leading cause of death. It happens early in life and it's why we do our best to try to screen kids. This graph here is just to give you a sense that folks who have a genetic diagnosis, the expense of their health care is far greater. In the neonate, that sort of darker bar are kids who have genetic disease. They're far greater, far more expensive as far as their health care to figure out what's going on. And this is the cycle that we live in a lot of times in the hospital. Somebody is sick. We try to figure out what's going on. We treat them while we're trying to figure it out. We see how they do. And then we kind of adjust. And we go through this cycle back and forth and kind of wait till we either figure it out or they get better on their own. And that causes, as you can imagine, worry, suffering, expense. Kids can pass away because we don't figure out what's going on. So the idea of using genetics is to kind of bust out of this cycle fast. So if we use genetics, genetic testing, if we look in the DNA to try to find changes, we can figure out what's going on quickly so we don't have to go around in that cycle. We give folks the treatment that they actually need and we get them to a place of health faster, cheaper, and better. So genetic testing in general, the red line, gets you where you want to go faster and quicker and it saves money. And again, I'm trying not to be an evil businessman, but money talks sometimes when it comes to healthcare. So this was a study that was done that compared kids that were diagnosed with a rare genetic disease 
and kids that weren't diagnosed with a rare genetic disease with genetics. And I have boxed in the red thing there, the, the cost savings between the two. And all I want you to see is how many digits are in those columns. Five, six, did any of them reach seven? No, we, 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 we maxed out at uh, um, six digits. It makes sense, right? If you're sick and we figure out what's going on right away, we do a better job of giving you care. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what we've done at Helen DeVos and to see how that sort of springboards um, past that. So at Helen DeVos, we started using what we call rapid whole genome sequencing about four years ago. And it was an idea that our administration had kind of saying, hey, where are things headed? And we got support from the Helen DeVos Foundation to do rapid whole genome sequencing on six kids that were in the ICU. Okay? The idea behind rapid whole genome sequencing is looking through the entire genetic code, looking for that one, and doing it fast. Okay? We don't do the testing. There's not many places that do. So we formed a partnership with a children's hospital and genomics institute actually in California. And we send the samples from Michigan to California, and we can still get results back as soon as two days. So it's really given us a way to take those six ki sick kids and figure out what's going on quickly. So in the first 23 months that we did this, we had about 22 kids go through this, and you'll see that we got a slam dunk diagnosis in almost three quarters of those kids let alone that there were a few that were kind of undergoing further study. And we hit a sweet spot for a while where we got 12 in a row. Um, this is honestly a little bit high. Others that have done this didn't have a diagnostic rate quite as high as we did. We were a little bit more careful with who we did the testing on. But again, we kind of proved the concept of if we do this, we'll see what others have seen at other centers and give better care. So I'm not going to read all of these to you. But I just want to give you a sense of the different ages that some of these kids had testing done at, some of the different health issues that they had, and some of the different outcomes that we had. Surgeries avoided, medications changed, palliative care, because this was not a condition that was going to be compatible with life. We had one patient that was diagnosed, unfortunately, after she passed away. But we were able to give that family an answer for why their baby passed and help them understand that there wasn't a risk for it to happen again. How important is that for a family? So every case that's kind of gone through this rapid genome sequencing has taught us so much. And it's really, again, kind of turned the way that we're delivering care in pediatrics. And we're going to see that expand beyond. So I want to go to California again and tell you about a project that they did there called Project Baby Bear. So this was a partnership for California Medicaid in five children's hospitals in California. And what they basically said was, we're going to let you do rapid whole genome sequencing. We're going to pay you for it. And we're going to see how things go. OK? So for this particular one, they ended up having 154 babies that went through this. 66% of them got a diagnosis, so about you know, a third, if you will. Change in care for 45 of those, and that average time to result of three days. So that's really good. This is where it really gets exciting, though, because they were able to show that they saved in those kids over 500 days in the hospital, again, avoiding surgeries, less tests, and $2.5 million in healthcare savings. So this is, again, kind of the rare win-win-win, that it's good for the patient, it's good for the healthcare team, and then it's good for the healthcare system as well. So, what happened in Michigan? So, about two years ago, we started our own project here in Michigan across the entire state called Project Baby Deer. And if you're curious about the animals, it's, they're actually state animals. So, bears the state animal of California and deer in Michigan. I was at a conference earlier this week and Minnesota is getting ready to do one too. They call theirs Project Baby Loon. I gotta tell you all of them now. Florida has Project Baby Manatee. And uh, Texas is working on Project Baby Dillo for Armadillo. <laughs> so what we did in Michigan was take what they did in California and try to expand it. Because we felt like there was an opportunity to provide access from what we'd learned at Helen DeVos to rapid genome sequencing, regardless of where a kid was born in Michigan, and to try to figure out how to do it right, try to figure out how to understand it, and to try to advocate on behalf of kids for this. So 
These are all the children's hospitals in the state that have uh, uh, inpatient uh, uh, children's hospitals. And we were able to work together very unofficially, which doesn't happen a lot in healthcare, and kind of roll this out and see what happens. Um, this actually started as a partnership first with Helen DeVos and Bronson, and then kind of rolled from there. And we did similar things to California, but what we did was we said, hey, any children's hospital can participate. We said you could be up to 18 years old. California, they capped it at one year. Um, we said you just needed to be in the hospital in the critical care unit or like sick enough, if you will. And then we need to do it quick. We need to do it fairly shortly after someone was admitted. So the things that were different, all centers, didn't matter what insurance you had. We engaged actively up front with the payers in Michigan to let them know this was happening and we committed up front to gathering data about how things went. So we had, similar to the baby bear, we had our takeaways here. So in Michigan, we had 89 kids that went through. You'll see the seven different children's hospitals that participated, and similar numbers as far as how many we diagnosed and how many had a change in management. And then I boxed for you again, the, sen these, the sense of how much money was saved and then what that equates to per patient. And this was really important because as we were going through this, we were talking with Michigan Medicaid. And as, depending on how much you know about healthcare, everything kind of hinges on Medicaid and Medicare. What they do, all the private payers end up following. So we committed with Michigan Medicaid up front to gathering this data and working with them and telling patient stories of sweet little ones that got diagnoses from this that really changed the way that uh, their care was delivered. And last September, Michigan Medicaid was actually the first state to write a coverage policy for rapid whole genome sequencing. And I don't know how excited you get about healthcare policy, I don't typically, but this was unbelievable. Um, I actually got a call the day it came out from somebody and they thought it was a joke um, because it was so leading, if you will. So what Michigan Medicaid essentially has said is they believe that it is worth it from a medical standpoint, but also honestly worth it from their bottom line to cover the cost of the test and to actually pay for the test separately because they see that it's actually gonna be better in the long run for everybody involved. And it's very exciting that this happened last September. So we just celebrated the one year anniversary. Minnesota, Oregon, Maryland and now Louisiana and California have all done the same thing. And you know what their policies look like? They look like the Michigan policy because they copy and pasted it. And that's really, really exciting. And it's a way that's really rewarding for something that started at a children's hospital in Michigan, spread south, spread east through our entire state and now has rolled out for kids in the rest of the US. And last week, I was on a panel virtually with the White House that talked about this from sort of a federal standpoint. What is the, 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 the action that needs to happen for this testing? Because again, hopefully intuitively it makes sense to you and you don't, aren't, don't have to just believe me, but this is the kind of thing that helps everybody. So with that said, I'm gonna kind of go into some fun stuff here and some of the things that are kind of advancing and growing. So, this is a story of Hazel, and Hazel is a little girl who has a rare genetic condition called Noonan syndrome, okay? Her story is kind of based on five days in her life. So she came to Helen DeVos Children's Hospital from actually a few hours away, got admitted with some heart issues, and was planned to go for um, a heart procedure over the weekend. And when she got admitted, we kind of had a sense that she was gonna be there for a couple of days, but no one knew what was going on. She didn't have her diagnosis yet. So we were able to use rapid whole genome sequencing over the weekend and to get a diagnosis for her that allowed her to get out of the hospital and get home sooner. Because what happens when folks are sick sometimes? We put them in the hospital, we do a test, we see how things go, remember that cycle? But we busted out of that cycle and were able to know what we were dealing with and get her home and with her family faster than we could have if she hadn't had that diagnosis. So an example of kind of how the speed makes a practical difference. This is another example of some work that we partnered with Michigan State on. Another baby actually came from the Lansing area, transferred, freshly born, very, very low muscle tone and seizures. 
she had rapid whole genome sequencing and found a change and circled in red there you'll see some of my least favorite words an uncertain significance result we found something in her genetic code but we don't know if it's the answer or not and that's really hard because what do you do when you don't know exactly what's going on so this particular condition has other non-genetic tests that you can do to kind of confirm it but they take about two weeks so when this result came back we sent that testing and we waited to see what we would learn from that but at the same time we kind of ran a little bit of an experiment and we shared the genetic change that had been found with a colleague of ours who does computer modeling of genetic differences and this is exciting to nerdy folks but a little bit overwhelming <laughs> He was able to look at the genetic change, where it is in the gene and the protein, look at how it's sort of been passed down and predict for us that it looked like it should cause problems. And he was able to do that within two days. A couple weeks later, we got our other testing back that did confirm the diagnosis. But what this gives me an example of is the ways that we're gonna be able to use kind of those computational tools to drive things forward faster when we find those uncertain results. Because the more we do genetic testing, the more uncertain things we're gonna find. So we have to figure out what to do with those uncertain things so when it happens, we know what to do. All right, the next piece I wanna talk to you about is kind of this middle area between the DNA and the protein. So our DNA actually gets turned into RNA first, and the RNA is what goes out and tells the proteins how to be made, okay? If DNA is kind of the blueprint for a building, RNA is kind of going to the building site and seeing has the foundation been laid, is the roof on? It's kind of the snapshot of what's going on more in real time. So we're starting to look at sequencing the RNA to figure out what's going on like in this moment versus the DNA, which is always there, okay? So this is a story of a teenager that got admitted to the ICU up at Helen DeVos with multi-organ dysfunction and that is a heart lung bypass machine there it's called an ECMO machine and the sickest of the sick go on ECMO and you'll see a picture of her there after all of this so it's a happy story and what happened to her so this is a timeline of what happens so 10 days before she got put on that heart lung bypass machine she went to her primary care doctor with fever muscle aches she's kind of feeling crummy she got put on some antibiotics and sent home. That is not atypical whatsoever. But what was atypical was 10 days later, her organs all shut down and she had to go on a heart lung bypass machine. That's not how things usually go, right? Well, we just happened to be doing a separate research study when she got admitted to the hospital. This is, uh, uh, he likes to be called Dr. Raja. He's the director of research for all of Spectrum and he was looking at RNA sequencing. So we were able to take samples from her and look at her RNA sequencing at different time points during her illness. And then on the back end, kind of put all that together. So this uh, picture over here, our patient is the, the green dots here and control patients are the red dots. And what I want you to notice is that they're separate. So her RNA was consistently different than normal. And that tells us something because we were also able to look at how her RNA changed over time. And so what this actually did for us was uncover this kind of new concept that we called viral induced genetics. So it turns out why she got so sick was she got Epstein-Barr virus, which is also sometimes called mono or the kissing disease, right? Plenty of people get mono and don't have all their organs shut down. But she had a genetic change that she was born with and when she got sick, it sort of uncovered that genetic disease. So if I can use an analogy for you of computers and kind of the antiviral software that we use to prevent things from happening, in this particular phenomenon, the virus kind of turns off that software and lets the corrupted file that was in the computer from the beginning show itself. If the illness doesn't come, it never gets uncovered, so nothing ever happens. So this was an example for us of taking the DNA and then using the RNA to kind of add to it to help some, uh, something make more sense in real time. And didn't we all just go through something in the world where some people got a virus and got really sick 
and some people got it and didn't get sick at all. And so we were able to take what we started in kids and replicate the same study in adults. So during the COVID pandemic, we were actually collecting samples from COVID patients and looking at their RNA and seeing that sure enough, people were clustering into kind of two different groups. Some groups, their immune system was super, super elevated. Other people, their immune system was super, super depressed. And you know what we shouldn't do is treat those patients the same way, because if your immune system is overactive, we should try to calm it down instead of trying to blow it up. And if your immune system is depressed, we shouldn't try to um, depress it further. So it was exam it's an example of how one thing leads to another leads to another. The things that we learn from one patient, we can apply to lots of other patients. And that's the kind of thing that I really enjoy because it gives you a sense of seeing the future that you can learn from the patient that's in front of you. A couple more stories for you. Just hang in there. I appreciate it. So this is a story of two little babies that were actually born at different hospitals. And this is a picture of one of them. So this is a journal article we haven't published yet. It's been accepted, but it hasn't come out yet. You may have to turn your head sideways a little bit, but that baby's a little bit distinctive looking. It had a heart difference, had, was born with a, a cloudy corneas, so couldn't see correctly. Ended up having genetic testing, found a change in the gene, but that gene had no known syndrome. It didn't have a known genetic condition. So unfortunately, this baby passed away. And then two years later, her parents had another baby, this time at a different hospital. But we were ready this time, kind of knowing the potential genetic risk, found that the second baby had the same genetic changes. And again, unfortunately, that baby passed away. But we now have two kids that seem like they have the same thing, but there's no known disease for it. So what we attempted to do was kind of uh, 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 what you do in, in science is kind of publish papers and kind of say, hey, this is what we found. We think this might be a, a new condition. And the journal actually came back and said, we get what you're saying, but like, how do we know for sure? So one of the folks that was involved in this work actually ran into somebody who works at a, a, a mouse research facility called the Jackson Lab. And the Jackson Lab is like the most famous mouse facility in the world. And they had a mouse that they had made that was just sitting on the shelf that had changes in this gene. And I'm not very good with mice. That's not, not like my research thing. But those mice had heart differences. They had differences in their vision. And so this was what we would call a mouse model that kind of proved that what we saw in a human was truly a new disease. So this is an example of when we do genetics and we find something and we know it's real, but we don't know what it is, how you can take that and push things further to sort of define new things. Okay, and I'm going to give you one more example of how that happens, but then something that we can do about it. So this is one of my most, probably my most favorite patient ever. This is a little girl that we saw. She had very, very low muscle tone, developmental delay, and you'll see she's missing something on the top of her head and above her eyes. She has no hair, but this little girl was actually born with a full head of hair. It all just fell out very shortly after she was born. So she came to us in genetics clinic. We eventually did genetic testing, and we found that she had one of those variants of uncertain significance in a gene called ODC1. And similar to the last story I just told you, there was no known disease that goes with ODC1. So this was a bit of a medical mystery for us. So I work in this building here, and it turns out that just a couple blocks away, there's a gentleman, Andre Bachman, who works at Michigan State who has been studying the ODC1 gene for 25 years. I had never met Andre before. I went to Grand Rounds at the Children's Hospital where he was presenting with Dr. Raja about some work that they were doing. And in their presentation, they kept mentioning this word called polyamines. I'd never heard of polyamines, and you probably haven't either, but it's kind of an interesting sounding word, if you will. So. That presentation went, and I happened to go back and look at my patient's test results and see that that ODC1 gene works in polyamines. So I was in a meeting with Dr. Raja, and we finished up, and I kind of elbowed him and said, 
Do you think that do you think ODC one would be of any interest to to Dr. Bachman? And he dropped everything in his hands, grabbed his phone out of his pocket, and called Andre immediately. And in the in the movie A Christmas Story, um, you know when the boy swears and he's got the bar of soap in his mouth and he rats out his friend and his mom's on the phone and you kind of hear on the other end of the phone like the rrr, rrr, rrr. that's what Andre sounded like on the other end because this was something that sort of he and the research community around polyamines had been wondering if it existed for years. So this particular genetic condition is very unusual and that all the changes happen at kind of this end of the, the, the tail of the gene and the protein. And when it's missing, the protein doesn't go away. So in our particular patient, so I'm going to show you some science here, the bar here shouldn't be here. But the fact that it is tells us that there is too much protein. And this particular gene hits in this pathway. This is all the metabolism in our body. And there's something called the urea cycle kind of right in the middle. And right off of the urea cycle are these kind of um, enzymes and genes where um, our body kind of uses and makes energy. And to show you another uh, uh, um, graphic here, sorry, I know this is a little all over the place. ODC is here, and it helps convert these things called polyamines in our body. And so what we're able to do again with our patient sample was show that the polyamine levels were abnormal. So the protein was abnormal, the polyamine levels were abnormal. This is how science happens. You find things and you kind of prove it in the lab. But we also got very, very lucky that in the mid 90s, a mouse model had again been made that had changes in the ODC1 gene and the mice didn't have hair. So similar to the story I just told you, this is an example of something where in 1996, in the middle of Pennsylvania, some researcher made a mouse and they didn't have hair. And now I have a patient in front of me who has a change in the exact same gene and they don't have hair, hair either. So we started to put the pieces together and publish this as a new genetic condition. And we had one single patient that we had ever heard of in the entire world. What those mice also had were cysts underneath their skin. So this is the edge of the skin, and you can kind of see that cyst there. And our patient also had giant cysts that she was growing, as big as a golf ball. So you know, kind of connecting the dots, right? But we also got very, very lucky that in this particular pathway where our gene is here, there's a drug that was known to interact with that particular gene. And in those mice that didn't have hair, I'll come back to this in a second. In those mice that didn't have hair, when they gave them the drug, they regrew their hair. Oh, that gets exciting, right? That particular drug, it's called DFMO or eflornithine, has been known since the 70s. It was actually first made to treat African sleeping sickness. And it's, it's kind of still manufactured to be given to the World Health Organization to treat that but it's also been used to treat a particular cancer called neuroblastoma, and that's a kid's cancer. So what happens when you have a drug that's been used before in kids is you have what we call safety data, and you know that this drug is fairly safe, and it's been used in kids. So what we had to work with was a patient who had changes that we proved in the lab, we had a mouse that had similar things that when it was treated with a drug got better. And we had a drug that we knew was safe, but we also knew it was safe in kids. And then the last thing we ended was we took a little bit of skin from our patient and in the lab treated it with the, the drug and things looked good in the lab too. So we had as much as we could possibly have to go through what we would call a single patient treatment trial or a compassionate use. So working with the FDA, we got approval to treat one and only one patient with this drug. We got the drug company to ship us three kilos of it from uh, Taiwan. So a, a bag of white powder showed up at the children's hospital. You can imagine that was probably wild through customs. <laughs> and we were able to start treating our patient. So we went 
from publishing the syndrome to the patient sitting in our office and taking the first dose in 15 months. And that is pretty much unheard of. But this is the future of medicine, right? We find something in the genetic code and then we do something about it specifically because of the genetic change that they have. And this is our little girl, the day we started the drug, we gave them sort of a 3D model of the protein in the gene that she held. Get a sense of her lack of hair. She's in her stroller kind of just laying there. And we gave her the first dose, just a liquid. And we all kind of just sat there and we're waiting for her to like sit up and like say hello. Um, but a month later, her parents sent me that picture, two days before Christmas. And some eyebrows growing. And you'll see about a month later, more eyebrows growing. And then this was into treatment. She's sitting up. Oh. And her therapist is eventually going to give her a little bit of a push. So you're seeing the muscle tone. This was a girl that just laid there. She couldn't even roll over. And this was her several months into treatment. You'll see all the hair growing. This was her in her first winter. Riding a sled down the hill. And then when she finishes, she's going to fall backwards. And then she now has the ability to sit up. Her family didn't have winter clothes for her because they never had to take her out in the snow. And then this was one of the more recent videos that her family sent of her being able to scoot around. So she can now scoot around the house. She can put trash in the trash can. She's using sign language. The transformation is, I struggle to find words sometimes to get it right. And this is the first patient, first patient treated. And this is her this summer out west, living her best life as her parents told me. And we published this treatment and we showed that everything that was abnormal got normal, if I can just put it simply and it got normal real quick. So we kind of, again, did what was right for the patient, but from a scientific standpoint, we tried to learn from it too. So that was patient number one, and then we had a second patient come to us. And this little guy, you'll again see he's missing a bunch of hair, kind of in the middle that he was born with, but he didn't live here in Michigan. This family actually connected with our first family on Facebook, because that's how everything happens, it seems. And we tried our darndest to figure out how to get treatment to them where he lived, but we could not figure it out. So the family eventually said, hey, we're just going to come to you. So they traveled here to Michigan, and we were able to compress the timeline a little bit. And within 13 months of him getting diagnosed, getting to us here in Michigan, going through all the process again, we were able to start him on treatment last summer. And this is him before we started. Let's see again, sitting, no hair. And this, about a month in, he sprouted eyebrows. He started to grow hair. He started to grow more hair. And then this is a little grainy because it's cell phone footage. Well, this is him walking. And this, again, was a child who did not walk. Um, and then this is the two of them together, vacationing this summer, wearing their official Bachman Bup buddy bibs. <laughs> um, we know of 11 patients in the world now that have this condition, so not a lot. And I'm not going to talk through the other patients, but just give you a sense that they're all over the place. Um, they have many similar features, and we're continuing to learn a lot more about it. Um, not all of them are in the U.S., because genetic disease is everywhere. And most excitedly, and I'm not going to talk about this much, we are now working with a patient who was diagnosed at two weeks of life and who we were able to start on treatment within nine weeks, so 11 weeks. And this has just been absolutely outstanding. So invite me back and I'll tell you more about that another time. <laughs> we continue to know about more and more diseases in this pathway and there's a lot of other things to be found. And so one of the exciting things about genetic disease and treatments is maybe we'll find things that will be able to be used for other conditions they're in the same place. So this is kind of an image that I sometimes feel like with genetics. And it's just a tidal wave that's going to crush us all. But I really do feel like we're reaching the ability to kind of surf this. 
but I also have this image that comes a lot to mind because I don't want this to just be like we figured it out, we're on our way, we're on the yellow brick road, we've got it. I think we're maybe like near the red, the yellow brick road, if you will, but maybe being more practical. There are lots of different people and groups that are kind of all over the place. But when it comes to genetics, genetics and healthcare, I think what we have to be careful of is that we don't fall asleep, right? We have to be aware of what's going on. We have to talk about it. We have to think about it. We have to engage, which is exactly what times like this are for. Um, so I hope this has been encouraging, exciting. I hope it's been a little bit educational too. Thank you so much, and I would love to hear thoughts or questions. You mentioned early in your talk about people who've had some kind of illness and they've been looking and looking for what their diagnosis is and, and not found it. Is there any, are there any programs now that people in those conditions, in, in those circumstances can get help through and get this kind of genetic testing done and perhaps discover what their diseases are? Yeah, the National Institutes of Health has something called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network or the UDN, and it does exactly what you just said. It takes patients or families, because sometimes something runs in the family, so there are multiple people, and it kind of looks at them like medical mysteries and uses a variety of scientific tools to try to solve those mysteries. It's been wildly successful. It does not find an answer in every patient, but the idea behind it makes sense that if we look hard enough, we'll probably find something eventually. It's just a matter of how quick and how easy it is to find. I think so. You can have a diagnosis, but we don't have any hope for you. We don't have anything right now. Yep. And how does that dovetail with the orphan drug situation in the United States, because all of these are extremely rare cases, yep. and the government probably doesn't fund that very well. And then the other question is an ancillary to that, but uh, how does uh, artificial intelligence figure into identifying um, cures for people with these genetic problems? Oh. So much good stuff there. I love it though. All right, let me see, how am I gonna hit all that? Certainly, most genetic conditions and diseases do not have targeted treatments. That's just the reality. But more have treatments now than ever before, and we are finding treatments at a higher rate than we ever had before. So one of my hopes with what we've done with the ODC1 gene is that it's a model of how to go from finding something to treating it very quickly by using a repurposed drug. There have to be other situations where that would apply. We also have new technologies like uh, gene therapy that are being used in a small number of conditions. But again, as we use them, we understand them better. So I think there's still gonna be a huge gap between finding stuff and finding what you do. A lot more of the impact that we see now is about all of the other things that we do to try to figure out what's going on. We can stop all that when we figure out the genetic cause. We don't have to keep doing the MRIs and the other tests and things like that. The artificial intelligence thing is a, is a, is a really excellent point because one person's brain can only hold so much information. But when you put all the information together in something like an electronic medical record, you can start to pull out patterns and find things, almost mining that data too. So an example I, I've heard before is looking through an electronic medical record and looking at something like diabetes that lots of people have and looking for patterns of what drugs seem to, in a large population, seem to have the best outcome. So using that artificial intelligence to improve our care. Where AI comes in with genetics is looking through those genes and looking through the changes in the genes fast without having somebody have to manually do it. So where we're headed now is for a computer to kind of suggest these are the most likely genetic changes from what the computers found and a human can check through five or 10 of those quickly instead of a human having to do hundreds or thousands of checks all by themselves. So that's an example of how it's sort of speeding things up 
but the genetics side of it. Are you educating insurance companies? Well, it, it, honestly, it depends a little bit too on what insurance you're talking about, right? If it's health insurance, then that's a different ball game than if it's life insurance or disability insurance, long-term care insurance. There are protections in place through the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. That's from 2008, though. There's a long time that that was passed that do have protections when it comes to health insurance and employment, but there are not protections with genetic information when it comes to life insurance or disability insurance. So if you or loved ones have gotten that kind of insurance lately, they're now starting to ask, do you have a genetic condition? Have you had genetic testing? And they can then change things based on that. For health insurance is a little bit different though, um, as far as the motivations for genetics, because if we understand someone's genetics, we really do give them better care, but there's gonna be trade-offs and it's hard to get policy and things like that to change. Hey, ultimately, um, instead of using medications, you talked about gene therapy. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could have CRISPR go in and fix the genetic defect? Ultimately, wouldn't that be an ideal yep. cure? Yep. Uh, you may or may not be aware of CRISPR. It's sort of a, a technology, if you will. One of the things that's very exciting about CRISPR is that it's not expensive to use in, like, the research setting. You know, to do a mouse model and to do experiments on, on animals or whatever, takes years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. CRISPR is very, very accessible and cheap, so you can use it and uh, kind of learn quickly. So I'm still mostly just a regular doctor seeing patients and talking with them. So we more sort of try to understand things rather than doing sort of those sorts of technology things. Yeah, I was wondering about the, uh, what you would have to go through ethically to change the DNA of a say an embryo, for instance, of some uh, couple that wanted to have a more healthy child because they carry a defect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the ethical slippery slope with all of this is, is quite significant. So, you know, at least at this point for what we're doing here in Michigan, it's still mostly taking care of patients and trying to figure out what's going on and then uh, going from there. So not as much into that realm. The human side is what's most important, but also looking at the cost screen that you showed, with about $800,000 in cost, a child that has been checked at birth and found in need, $800,000 savings and roughly 700000 in cost, or about a 16% savings. Um, first, I would hope, not knowing anything about the subject, I'd hope there'd be a bigger margin mm -hmm. of difference between cost and savings. And secondly, in the confused billing world of medical that exists today, how, how do you calculate? And that's what makes a lot of the economics of this very hard, is it's really hard to do calculations of medical costs. I don't know how many bills you've gotten looked over, but they're pretty darn complicated to read um, and make sense of what actually costs what. So it's one of the challenges, and you don't want to over, um, over exaggerate things and think that it's going to be more than it is. You want to be realistic. Uh, the medicine that you describe today and the medical care that we experience every day, our typical annual physical seem to be worlds apart. Is there a connection? And, or if there's not, how do you create the connection between the day-to-day -day practitioner and the, the specialist such as yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, e education is a big part of this. There are a sizable number of healthcare professionals that were trained when none of this was known or taught. So there's a big gap let alone students that are still being trained right now. Genetic, they have a lot to learn. And I really like genetics and think it's fun, but not everybody does. So there's, there's a long way that we have to go there. I do think that you know, rare disease and genetic disease can be a really good learning ground for the rest of the population. You know, For example, there are some genetic diseases that um, cause obesity. If we understand that in a rare disease, how can we understand something like obesity that can be applied to the rest of the population? Or, 
you know, cystic fibrosis with lead, uh, breathing and lung problems. So how can that inform what we know about asthma that many, many people have? So I think that's a lot of the hope of genetics and, and some of the things that are more unusual and rare is what will we learn there that we can apply to more and more patients.